Oh man, uh, depression to me, from my experiences, it gets me really, really low. I mean, sometimes I do have suicidal thoughts. Coping with depression. Next on Black Nouveau. Good evening and welcome to this edition of Black Nouveau. I'm Milton Dockery. And I'm Faith Colas. We're glad you could join us. On this edition, we're going to look at depression and discuss ways families can cope Thank with the you. disease. We'll also review the art of Zenobia Bailey and choreographer Reggie Wilson. But we begin with art of another sort from my home city of Racine, where 91-year-old cobbler Bob Graham, Dr. Bob the Shoe Repairman, has been in business for almost 50 years. Since 1989, Racine's Washington Avenue has been the home of Bob's Shoe Repair. Dr. Bob, as he is affectionately known, has been doing shoe repair in Racine since he opened his first shop in 1963. Bob moved to Racine in 1952, a year after he passed through visiting some relatives. Well, my, when I came when I came in, my had a sister-in-law living here, so I came in. I was on my way to California, okay. and so it was, it was back then a lot of work. It used to be a lot of industrial town. But manufacturing was thriving when Bob moved his family here. See, I worked in the farm here for 25 years, from 52 up to 68. But I was working, I had this here, I worked doing this here, too. Uh, yeah. Dr. Bob is still going as strong as his 90-plus-year-old body would allow. But I've been doing shoes all my life. Well, I started when I did school. As a kid in the South, he spent a lot of time around shoe shops and just naturally took to them. When he moved to Racine, he worked in the foundry of American Steel for 26 years, but he did shoes on the side. He found time to play ball for the Racine Blues, a semi-pro Negro League team, and he raised a family. In recent years, the loss of factory jobs coupled with the changes in the shoemaking industry have slowed his business. It's going by the wayside because people that get, used to get shoes fixed, they don't, get, they don't have them fixed no more now. They don't, you know, you know uh, because uh, they throw them away, see, because they can buy cheap, buy some shoes, buy new ones, buy cheaper, and then they have them fixed. They got a good shoe of Mercedes or floating or something, they have them fixed. But they got some shoes, cost 18, 19 dollars. They, they go and buy some new ones. See, but cost of most of them, the 18, 19 dollars shoes that you can't, they are unfixable. The quality is not there. All the shoes made in the United States, it's made, made overseas now. And the quality not they take these here, these here, but these made in China. The customers he serves today keep him busy, but not too busy. Some weeks you do quite a, quite a few. Some weeks you don't. You know, I, I ain't been keeping up with that. I better. It's, it keep me busy, you know. You know, I don't try taking too much. I have so much that I do. Age and the physical challenges it brings have caused Dr. Bob to consider retiring. So Dr. Bob, I the riders have slowed you down a little bit? Oh yeah, it slowed you down quite a bit, you know. Uh, you you know. Have, are you training anybody to take your place? Oh, well, that's something. Um, you, you, uh, young people ain't gonna take it now. You just mean so many shoe shop because this is, ain't nobody take that up now. See, these young will not take that up. So. And most of uh, my age, let alone the young, is retired, so he couldn't. Dr. Bob says he plans to retire in a year or so. We wish him well. In the American story, artists from far and wide fuse personal identity with cultural heritage. Zenobia Bailey dives into the African American aesthetic of crochet. Now, with the aesthetic that you learned in school and what you had grown up with, is that is this a combination of those works, or 
Is this your, um, your idea of the African-American aesthetic? My instructors told me there was no such thing as an African-American aesthetic, and I told them there was because that's how I was in art school because I was, um, that, and that, that's the aesthetic that I was raised on because I deal with, a, with the aesthetic of funk. It's really um, based on an emotional, um, rhythm, pattern, kind of development, and the color combinations. There's no uh, set um, technique to do it it's, except for the stitching, but as far as the surface design, you know when it works and you know when it doesn't work. When did you start displaying your works or um, this collection? Well, this collection started at the turn of the century. Started doing a residency I was in in the Studio Museum of Harlem. Nothing was done as far as that residency was concerned. And I titled that Paradise Under Reconstruction in the Aesthetic of Funk. That was the first stage. From there, I was just working for seven years. It was a seven year project. I was just working on different components, kind of trying to build the whole concept together. I started with the hats. The hats I used myself as the muse. Right. And I started designing hats that would I could wear to the different functions and different things that I go to to develop that lifestyle. Hats take about two weeks to do. The other pieces are um, the mandalas, they're points of concentration for meditation. These are based off of a lot of um, inspirational and spiritual artifacts from different cultures and combining um, the aesthetic of funk to it. Does each one of these pieces, like some of these are just, they look so extremely vast and time consuming. How long does it normally take you to do a piece? What I do with each piece is I just do individual circles. Mm -hmm. And I just do like a bunch of different circles, different sizes, and then I'll just all of a sudden st stop and take the largest piece and put it on the wall. And then I'll take another piece and I'll start composing the different pieces. And then after I see that it's where I want it to be, then I start putting the blanket stitch to stitch them all together. But um, it's, um, it's, it's, it's a phase of a lot of crocheting. And the largest pieces take about a month to do, maybe a couple of weeks to a month to do. Hmm. And um, the smaller pieces, I don't even know because I'm just, you know, I never really time them or right. anything. But um, the tent took about six months to do. This tent here took about six, six months to do. And you put, you put the garments for each one of these? Yeah, I made the garments. Yeah. The I made everything for them. The faces are made out of terracotta clay. I made a mold for them. And then I painted it over with acrylic paint. Mm -hmm. And then um, I made their dresses. In addition to her artwork, Zenobia has also developed a workshop. What is the workshop itself about? The, the workshop itself is about creativity and community development. And that's what this is. This is a community. And this is a community that's like gypsies on the road, you know. And like what we're doing, we set up camp here. Mm -hmm. And we have the workshops in the artery. And from that workshops, we're trying to stimulate, inspire creativity within the communities wherever we go. And really, it's something that everybody can do right now. Because like every, in every household, it's every, somebody knows how to crochet, somebody knows how to knit, somebody knows how to sew, you know. Okay. So it's just being inspired to do it, you know. But all this, nothing is new. None right. of it is new. It's all about the needle, the imagination, and just taking the time to do it with a heap of yarn and imagination. And your imagination takes you to, you know, New wherever you want, want to go. You know, it's like your, your magic carpet ride. In the work that I do, I often try and find ways of um, reclaiming African and African-American history that has kind of had a negative light turned on it 
and use that as a place of empowerment or strength. Milwaukee native Reggie Wilson is the founder and artistic director of Fist and Heel Performance Group. The New York-based ensemble takes dance to the next level, blending African movement with Caribbean, modern, and African-American dance. Wilson and his group are in Sheboygan collaborating with community groups and conducting workshops on African dance. I knew that there weren't a lot of presenting, dance presenting organizations in Milwaukee or the Wisconsin area. And being from Milwaukee, wanted to be able to bring my dance back home. What do you think it is about your particular dance group that makes you unique? The entire spectrum of the company is the spectrum of the African diaspora. We have African Americans, we have um, three Caribbean folk, two Trinidadians, one Jamaican. We have another African um, vocalist in the group. He's from Sierra Leone. He's a physical therapist as well. So it's a, it's a mix up. And to me, I think that's really important for people to see um, a spectrum of what humanity looks like as well as what the African diaspora looks like. How would you say your Milwaukee upbringing has influenced your production group. I mean, you mentioned that you guys are basically from all over and all different backgrounds. What would you say that you bring to the group, especially as a M Milwaukeean? Uh, frozen custard, no. Uh, <laughs> um, I love frozen custard, and we haven't had an opportunity to get it here. Um, there are weird little things that are peculiar to this region and Milwaukee, and um, also going to Chicago, and the, history of my family, which I think is true for a lot of black folks in this area, our families came up from the South, from the Delta, and what those cultures were and how they kind of shifted when they got up north. Wilson says his education at Rufus King High School also prepared him for working with people of different cultures. All of our parents knew the other parents and you know, they're Mexican, uh, Korean, white, black, Jewish, rich, poor, you know, east side, west side, north side, northwest side. <laughs> so that kind of model of we can get along, I think is something also that I got from my particular upbringing in Milwaukee. The main thread of the piece I think in my head was when I first encountered stepping, and not the, the fraternity stepping, but uh, hand dancing, partnering stepping. And um, that happened by me going back to Milwaukee. I live in New York, um, was visiting family over the holidays and wanted to go out one night, called a cousin of mine up and he said, okay, yeah, I know a club we can go to. We went into the nightclub and there were people there, not just one generation, but older people, younger people. Music felt a little slower than the R&B I was used to and had a kind of a really specific rhythm. And people were actually dancing <laughs> with their hands, which um, kind of haven't spent a lot of time on the East Coast. That was either supposed to be disco dancing or Latin dancing or maybe ballroom dancing. But in the African-American context, I didn't have a present day space in my brain for what that was supposed to be so I kind of freaked out I was like what it, what it, and they're all doing it and they're and it was so smooth and it was so cool and it was so um, connected to a sense of who I am or was as an African-American I'd been traveling a lot in the Caribbean I'd been traveling a lot in Africa going to a lot of nightclubs there and there people do hand dancing kind of stuff, but there's something about the vibe, the energy felt like that. So it was very connected to the African diaspora, but it felt very um, much produced. It was indigenous. It wasn't something that had been adopted into it. I could feel that it came from us. I don't like to consider myself an authority on anybody or anybody's culture, including my own. So the research that I do, I always see myself as an artist and that the lens that I'm, pres that the images that I'm presenting to the audience is through the lens of my eyes. And I want them to be conscious of that and conscious of the fact that they are also seeing this information through their life experiences. So the research to me, I tried, it 
comes into the work in a lot of different ways. It might be actually the way that it exists in the culture where it's from, or it might just be one element of that thing, of a particular dance. Humans have been moving for millennia, and how we come together um, is something that's really fascinating to me. So to me, if any, if, to spread that kind of gospel of, you know, take the importance off your shoulders. You're not, this is not something new. It can be done. People that are different can get together and coexist. I think that that's a really important kind of um, message and experience that people can have as well as witness and say, okay, that it, there's a possibility. Just to have that image in your brain somewhere is like, okay, this, it's a possibility. Becoming depressed is a natural part of living, but being depressed all the time is not natural nor healthy. Almost 20 million Americans suffer from depressive illnesses, and not surprisingly, African Americans are overrepresented in that population. In a few moments, I'll talk with Dr. Ramel Smith about ways families can cope with the disease. But first, Everett Marshburn has this report. Back light, yeah. key light, and the field light. It's half basically key, then the back light. Alan Newson enjoys working with students at the MATC telecasting program. He spends hours daily volunteering his time. He's been doing that for a number of years since his broadcasting career was cut short by illness. And that was but one in a series of challenging events for Alan. The oldest of four boys, he became the male head of the household at a young age when his mother's drug addiction split the family. I started taking care of my brothers when I was about uh, right before high school, so 13, so I started raising, taking over raising them for them for 13 from high school through college. Not long after college, he was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis, and shortly thereafter, diagnosed as being clinically depressed Depression, to me, from my experiences, it gets me really, really low. I mean, sometimes I do have suicidal thoughts. Sometimes I look over to the numerous bottles of pills over there and think, maybe I should just take them all and just end it all. But then my religion and my upbringing tells me that I shouldn't do that. Depression can be caused by imbalances in brain chemistry. It can also be triggered by stress, poor nutrition, personal loss, financial challenges, and relationship difficulties. Clinical depression is a mood disorder where feelings of sadness, loss, anger, or frustration can interfere with everyday life for weeks. I really don't want people to know how I how I feel, because I, <laughs> to me, it's a responsibility for me to always pretend that everything's all right. Al and his brother Jarrell share a small apartment. He has his moments. His moments range from, from one extreme to being happy, and the next being, you know, really sad and but I try to work with that as best as I can, you know. Seeing what he's going through, it has uh, taken its toll on me personally. Um, and I guess mentally as well. Um, since I also have um, depression as well. I hate the fact that he is clinically depressed. I think his depression affects me just about as bad as it affects him. Can you hand me a fork, please? We do help each other because there's all the time we can't go to a therapist and say what's wrong Thank with you. us. So for me being having gone through therapy more than he has. I know how therapists talk to 
take to bring people off that ledge. So I talk to him like that, and sometimes it works, and sometimes he looks at me and says, will you please talk to me normally like a brother instead of like a therapist? And that's when we really have a real talk. So you probably feel pretty squeezed. I feel squeezed pretty much 97% of the time, yeah. Yeah. I don't feel squeezed when I get my disability check and then that lasts for about three days after I pay all the bills and get food, it starts all over yeah. again, yeah. Alan has been in therapy for about seven years. He started seeing Jeff Luzon in the fall of 2010. It's important to understand that depression is common among everybody. And there are always varying features of depression. Maybe we call it clinical depression. If the symptoms are of a severity, frequency, and duration significant enough to meet a diagnosis. But most all of us are depressed, <laughs> maybe even at some point during every day, or uh, at some point every week or every month. It's just not more often than not. I think it's treatable. Uh, we certainly can lessen it. I think when someone has uh, something like MS, you might, be, you might not be talking about complete remission of this mood state. But if someone has misery, you know, and they're expect, uh, experiencing discomfort on a zero to 10 scale, and they say, oh, this is a nine, I cannot imagine it getting much worse. Maybe we can't bring it down to a zero, but what if we can bring it down to a six or a four? So we can do that. And Alan believes that there is light at the end of the tunnel. Sometimes I do, like today, and sometimes I don't when I'm in that real low place, but there is always the light that's at the end of the tunnel for me. Sometimes I don't see it, but some, I do see it. And we're joined now by a resident psychologist, Dr. Ramel Smith. Dr. Smith, welcome back to Black Nouveau. Thanks for having me, Faith. Ellen's case seems to be an extreme situation of clinical depression. Is it? His case is an extreme case, but sadly, it's not uncommon. Once we see depression really manifest itself and go to its worst states, we see things like this where there is very low self-esteem and when you have low self-esteem you have low ability to want to live and drive to do different things and it causes us to do a variety of things that's self-destructive. His brother also has been um, diagnosed as clinically depressed. Is there a hereditary connection? Yes, whenever we think about genetic predispositions, we understand it well when we talk about heart disease or when we talk about cancer, when we talk about things from a physical health standpoint, but we don't always get that correlation with mental health, but it's exactly the same. So if someone in your family has something, that means there's a higher chance that you will also suffer from either that mental illness or something similar to it. In our community, mental health issues, the discussion of it, the conversation yeah. of it, what's the reality for us? Well, I think what happened, it always started because it's always a us versus them. And when we looked at mental illness, it was a them, meaning white people. So we said, that's something for them that doesn't affect us. We were a resilient people. We had came through the legacy and the horrors and travesty of slavery, and we still were able to maintain with all of the injustice done. So that was something as a sense of pride that we had as a people. However, when we had to ask for help, it almost seemed as though it was a sign of weakness. So it was something that we stayed away from. And when you stay away from it, just because it's not diagnosed doesn't mean it's not present. But if it's not diagnosed, you don't have to say it. So the longer it went on to be, uh, if you want to say a kind of a, a black eye to be diagnosed with something, we veered away from it. So even if, if it was present, we didn't want it to be officially labeled on us or one of our loved ones. So how do we move past that? Well, you know what, we have to move past it because we're seeing the results of not dealing and dealing with undiagnosed mental health illness. We see people self-medicating all the time, so whether it be um, prescription drugs or whether it be through marijuana, alcohol, or gambling, things of that nature, there's always different things where we self-medicate. So what do we have to do? We have to start the conversation. We have to let people know it's okay. I recently was able to give a keynote presentation at the University of Wisconsin-Madison and in my presentation, it was talking about mental health and black people, and it was labeled, I'm not crazy, but I need help. And that's what we always use with mental illness. I'm not crazy, it's that negative thing that's there. And so what we wanna let people know is, no, you're not crazy, you just need help. 
but you would be crazy not to get help, so it's okay to get help. And if we can start the discussion and say, it's okay not to be okay, but we're gonna make sure that you can be okay, I think that's the first step in this process. And some of the language, like words like crazy, I mean, are those some of the things that, you know, kind of hold us back from getting help? Oh, that, you know, these old, these movies where people are strapped down and they're in, you know, asylums and things like that. Yeah, and I think that's a great point what you make, because sometimes what we label as crazy and asylum, the idiots and things of that nature, people say, well, I'm not that. So what we want to do is show them what true mental illness looks like, and not only mental illness, but how it looks like to be able to deal with it and walk with it. I think from a physical standpoint, when we saw Magic Johnson contract the HIV virus, but still live a life, that put a whole new spin on how people recognize HIV and AIDS. What we have to do is the same thing with mental illness. Those people who have been diagnosed with it but still live productive lives have to now become the poster children and say, hey, listen, this is something that you can have, not be embarrassed about, and not only not being embarrassed about, but still live a full productive life. What's the first step or the next step for a person or a family member that you know, identifies some behavior that could be depression? Well, the first thing what you want to do is you want to seek help. This is one of the things where you say, you know what, I might not know everything about this, so let me go to someone who I trust and who is competent, who might be able to give me directions. And if that's a little bit too much, what you can also do is now the Internet is a wonderful thing. We have so many different website sources. We have places like NAMI, the National Alliance of Mental Illness, Disability First, where you can go and get tons of information in a place where it is not very stigmatizing. In fact, most of the people who work there are consumers who suffer from mental illnesses, which always makes it easier to start that discussion. Healthcare and, and, and having that is going to be key into you know, resolving this or addressing this. And just very quickly, is there assistance out here, you know, financial assistance out here for families and individuals that need to be seen by a physician? Yeah, you know, honestly speaking, the, the, the quickest way is to go to prison, <laughs> and the prison has become a de facto mental health system, and many people who need mental health needs will go because that's one of the quicker ways. That's not what we want, obviously. What we want to do is be able to find what are those resources where I can still live my life. And those two places that I named, NAMI and Disability First, those are places where you can go to detain that can help you with information such as that. But we need to do a lot more as a community, getting on side of our legislators to make sure we create policies to make sure that those who need mental health illness can access it from a financial standpoint. Dr. Smith, thank you so much for joining us at Black New World. Thanks for having me. And that wraps up this edition of Black New World. Remember in the coming week, do something to expand your world. Good night. Good night, and thanks for watching.